Well, good morning. It's good to see you here today. I want to welcome you. If you haven't been uh, welcomed already, we're so glad you, you joined us this morning at, uh, for worship. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab it. And if you need a Bible, there's one in front of the pew there, and uh, that's there for you to use. And you can uh, start at the beginning and turn a few pages, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 5 and uh, actually 4 and 5 this morning. And as you do that, I just want to make you aware if you've seen see a little bit of a, a gap of people here and then in other places, there's about 150 of us that are away this morning at camp. Our students and many of our college leaders that help with our students and adult leaders are there. And uh, I was there yesterday morning and they were having a great weekend and I uh, actually spoke with Josh this morning and I know they had at least one student uh, come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior last night and they had many other gospel conversations. And so the Lord is at work and, uh, and thank you. You are part of your, your giving and your praying and your investment in our student ministry. Um, lives are being changed, and, and that's an awesome thing to be able to, to be a part of. And, uh, and so they're having a worship service this morning as they finish up, and I think they'll probably get back here. I don't know if they're planning on getting back right when the service ends or not. I probably should know that because most of my family is there with them. Um, I've, got, I've got some things to clean up at the house before Ellen gets back is what I'm saying here. So, um, but let's, uh, let's pray together uh, for them as we begin this morning. Lord, we thank you for um, just how you're working in our church. And Father, we pray for our students and our, their leaders as they gather this morning and as the word is proclaimed once again. And Father, we pray for any student that's just searching uh, for hope, um, that's never put their faith in Jesus. Lord, we pray this morning uh, they would do that. Um, Lord, I, I pray that for us as we gather here today. Lord, if there's someone here in our midst, Lord, that... Um, is looking to see what life is all about, Lord, I I pray that they would understand that life is about you. And there's nothing better in this world than to know you and to walk with you. And uh, and so, Father, we pray uh, for that end, for our students this morning, and for us as well as we open your word here in this place. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, have you ever searched um, your name on the internet? I don't know why you would do that. Maybe you're just curious to see um, who else has your name in the world. Um, Maybe you're curious to see where you stand. I'm not really sure the algorithm of how things work and um, when you put your name in, who gets first place, right? Who comes up first? Uh, Maybe it's the person who's most well-known, the person who is the most accomplished. I really don't know that. But um, for me, I gave it a whirl this past week. I actually typed in my name, Andy Needley, and just kind of wanted to see where I stand. You know, am I, am I known by anybody? I mean, there's a lot of videos out there, right? We, we put our videos on YouTube, and does that mean anything? You know, maybe, maybe I'm important. And, um, and so I searched up Andy Neely, and this is the guy who comes up. This is the most... <laughs> this guy trumps me in every way. I didn't know he existed. But if you want to know who the true Andy Neely is in the world, this is him right here. This is Andy Neely. And a few things about this Andy Neely. I've actually wrote these down here. He's pretty accomplished um, as far as Andy Neely's go. Um, (laughs) He's the founding director of the Cambridge Service Alliance and deputy director of the Advanced Institute of Management Research. He is widely recognized for his work on the servitization of manufacturing as well as his work on performance measurement and management. You know, that's a good sign that you're really important and your job is important when you don't understand, right? Have you ever asked somebody what they do and, and they tell you what they do and you have no idea, right? You, you don't want to ask them again, right? You want to, then, you, then you're really dumb. So you just pretend like you know what they do, even though you have no idea what they do. And um, they could probably try to explain it to you and it would be over your head. That's, that's this guy. Um, and he, um, he holds joint posts at Cambridge University, pretty important, and uh, the Cranfield School of Management. He previously has held appointments at the London Business School, Cambridge University, where he was a fellow of Churchill College and Nottingham University, where he completed his PhD and British aerospace. Okay, this is, this is my competition here as far as Andy Neely's go. And um, 
we probably, I don't know, we're probably about the same age. I don't think I'm ever going to eclipse them. You have to kind of scroll down the page to get to this Andy Neely, but eventually you can, you can find me. But once again, I'm not sure how the algorithm works, but you can't help but think, right? This guy is just really important, you know? And um, in, the, in the scheme of life, right, in the world that we live in, more people know who he is, right? He's Here's, here's a guy who has a life that's uh, making a difference. And I wonder when you think about your life, how, how do you measure the difference you make or the life you're living? How do you, how do you measure the, the worth of a life? Or maybe even more personal, how does a life that's well lived, what does that look like for you? Right, if you research your name up and see it on the internet, what would you want to be known for? Because the internet lives on, doesn't it? Uh, when we die, the information on the internet, that's one of the scary things. Um, if you get, make posts, right, you have to be careful because what's on the internet, it, it kind of lives on beyond you. It stays there. And what would you want the world to know about you when you move on? What's the legacy you want to leave? Well, we're going to talk about that this morning as we pick up the story uh, outside the garden in Genesis chapter four and five. And if you were here last week, we saw that uh, Cain, um, who was the son, the oldest son of Adam and Eve, um, brutally murdered his younger brother, Abel. And as this takes place, what we discover is that in 1 John, uh, way in the New Testament, he looks back, one of John, uh, Jesus' disciples, John, looks back as he looks back at this story and he says, in this moment when Cain, right, Adam and Eve's son, takes the, the life of his brother Abel, that he's like the evil one, that Cain is cursed, just as the serpent was cursed in the garden, now Cain is cursed because he is, in a way, he's done the work of the serpent. He's taken the life of one of Eve's um, descendants, right, the, the seed of the, of the promise, and so now with Abel's death, the question would have arisen, if you're reading the story originally, right, because you have Cain and he's kind of doing the work of the serpent, and then Abel, who was a, was a man who lived by faith, and remember he offered his best to God, the, the fat portion of his flock, the firstborn, now Abel is gone. So this promise that was given um, in the garden, right, that one day, Eve's descendants, right, the descendants of the woman would, would one day crush the head of the serpent. How's this, how's this promise going to come to fruition? Because now Abel, right, the, the, the one righteous son that they had that we knew of, he's been murdered. His life has been taken. And so this dilemma is solved as you continue to read down in chapter 4. Notice what it says in verses 4, uh, 25 and 26 in chapter 4. It says, this is after Abel's life has been taken, right? Adam was intimate with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has given me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. A son was born to Seth also, and he named him Enosh. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And so Seth here... Um, is the new son born to Adam and Eve. And Seth, like his deceased brother, he calls on the name of the Lord. He, he, he has a sense of faith in God. And uh, at this time, people call on the name, begin to call on the name of the Lord. And so uh, this is the first time after Abel's death that we see people again, once again, seeking the Lord. And so, here's how chapter 4 and chapter 5, or, or here's how we should think of them. They're, they're divided up into two specific lines of descendants, right? Genealogies of, of Adam through the line of Cain, and then Adam through the line of Seth. And as you read through, as you see a genealogy in the Bible, you know, it's, it's really easy to, to skip them, think they're not important. And, and I've been there, I've done that, right? You just don't want to have to go through all the names. Most of the time you can't pronounce them anyway. And, and so here we have the genealogy, two genealogies, but these two genealogies are important. Um, and they're not just meant to be read, they're actually meant to be compared and contrasted, right? You're to look at the genealogy of Cain, that's here in chapter four, and then the genealogy of Seth, right? You're to look at these and read these and to see that the author here is trying to show us something. 
And I think probably the most efficient way for us to, to do this this morning is to look at the seventh descendant of each one, seventh and descendant down from Adam through the line of Cain and the line of Seth. And um, why, I'm gonna, why I'm saying that is because we don't have time to cover them all. But in um, ancient Jewish writing, the, the, a lot of the biblical writers, and if you are familiar with the Bible, you'll know that they use numbers. Um, uh, they're, there's a, they're very strategic in the way that they use numbers. And one of the numbers that we see being used by biblical authors, um, which symbolizes wholeness and completeness, is number seven. And so if you go down and the seventh descendant of Adam, right, through the line of Cain and Seth, over here in Adam, we have through Cain, we have Lamech. And then over here, through Adam, we have a man by the name of Enoch. And so what I would like to do this morning is to Look at these two lines and compare them, but specifically address them um, through these two two men, Lamech and Enoch. And so first, we're going to look at the descendants of Adam through Cain and read down through um, Lamech. And so look with me there, starting in verse 17, it says, Cain was intimate with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And then Cain became the builder of a city, and he named the city Enoch after his son. Now, this is, uh, there's two Enochs here. Don't be confused, okay? There's some of the names are similar for both lines. And here, the first Enoch that we read about is the son of Cain. And Cain, um, that he built a city. And when we, when we think of city, we shouldn't think of like, you know, Nashville or, or even Jackson. A city, the word there for city could mean just a, a, a small village, right? It's just a grouping of, of people. And so this city is built by the line of Cain. And then he goes on, look what it says in verse 18. Um, Enoch, or Irad, uh, was born to Enoch, and Irad fathered Mahushael, and Mahushael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. Some great names there if you're, if you're pregnant. Um, Lamech took two wives for himself, one named Adah and the other named Zillah. And Adah bore Jabal, and he was the father of the nomadic herdsmen. And his brother was Jubal, and his father was uh, the father of all who play the lyre and the flute. And Zillah bore Tubal-Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. Tubal-Cain's sister was Naima, and Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, pay attention to my words. For I killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is to be avenged seven times over, then for Lamech, it will be 77 times. So as you read through the the line of Cain here, you end up with Lamech there. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there's some interesting things here that the author is trying to tell us. First of all, we see through the line of Cain, we see all kinds of, of advancement, right? We see the first city that takes place. We, um, his sons are very successful. You have Jabal, and he's the, he's the rancher or the, the nomadic herdsman. So um, we know that prior to this, they, uh, Abel raised um, animals, but here we have uh, the first nomadic herdsman. Uh, we think of other like cattle and those kinds of things. And then as you continue to read about Lamech, he had uh, two other sons. Uh, his other son, um, one Jubal was, he kind of led the whole musicians thing, like right? he was the original like singer songwriter dude with the lyre and the, the harp and whatever. And, and so, you know, if you're into music, Jubal is your guy. And um, this is where it all started. And then if you continue to read, then you have his third son was, uh, was by the name of Tubal Cain. And he worked with bronze and um, uh, other metals. And so he was, uh, uh, he was into technological advancement, okay? These were tools that they used. So Tubal Cain was the, was the Steve Jobs of his day, okay? He's, he's coming up with things to help people get, get work done. And, um, and, and so this was the line of Lamech. And once again, you see um, what's being impressed here is all kinds of advancement in the world. Right? These were, these were go-getters and, um, and had a lot to be proud of. But at the same time, um, Lamech also, in this line, had a lot to be ashamed of. For his life also represents a, a, a drastic moral decay. 
here. Um, first of all, notice that Lamech takes two wives. He has Ada and Zillah. And um, so this is the first instance of uh, polygamy that we have in scripture. And it's not the last. The Bible, um, you know, people look at the Bible and they think that, um, you know, it's, it's just kind of made up. But, you know, the Bible, it tells it like it is the good and the bad. And throughout scripture, we see the practice of polygamy and the Bible doesn't endorse it. Once again, the Bible's just telling the story. In fact, typically whenever you see polygamy take place, it always brings trouble, right? It always brings pain. It's never a good idea because it's a departure from God's initial intention. But we see that here with Lamech. He's the first one who does this for himself. And then as you continue to read down in verses 23 through 24, um, you see, it's almost like a, a poem or um, a song, and, and that's what it was. I mean, this is called the Song of the Sword, okay? And so this is Lamech, and he's boasting in himself. It kind of seems out of place, but he's boasting in himself. He's talking about his wives. He's, he's boasting with his words. He's, he's talking about his um, brutal actions. Apparently, there was a young man who, who did something. There was some type of altercation. And later on in Scripture, um, the, the command would be, um, you know, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, right? If one man sheds another man's blood, he, you know, his, his blood should be shed. But here we have Lamech, his, he wasn't, right, he, he was wounded in some way. But here he is, he's bragging about taking a young man's life. And we don't know how young, but uh, probably seemed to be at a disadvantage to Lamech. And Lamech is boasting, right, in what he has done. He brags about this. And in a way, he says, you know, others, if you do, you know, if you approach me in some way that I don't like, you'll suffer the same fate. In fact, verse 24 is similar to what the Lord does for Cain. Remember when Cain begs for mercy for the Lord up there in verse 24, um, it says that, actually not verse 24, uh, it talks about that um, the Lord protects Cain in a way and says in verse 15, you know, whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Well, now, Lebek's saying, I don't, I don't need the Lord to do this for me. I do it for myself, right? Seventy times seven. And so, um, Lamech here is, is, once again, the family, as you look across the board here, there, a lot can be attributed to them for what's taking place in the world, for human accomplishment. But at the same time, you can see they are very more immoral people. And I think that's a good word for us too. Listen, just because we make advances as a society doesn't mean we're becoming a more moral people. In fact, I would question, I think sometimes it's just the opposite. That technological advancement, right? Um, often it reveals and uh, technology is exploited by our sinful hearts. And we see that here with Lamech. So as you look at the line of Cain, it, it's marked by worldly advancement, moral decay, and, and, and the boasting of self. Do you see that? That it's, it's marked by, yes, advancement, but at the same time, there's, there's great moral decay and boasting in themselves. And this is all seen in the person of Lamech here. As he, in a way, once again, he symbolizes his, this line of Cain. Well, as you read on in chapter 5, we're introduced to another line, the line of Seth, right? Adam's line through Seth. And look, what it, look how this line begins differently than um, how the author talks about the line of, of Cain. And in verse five, or chapter 5, verse 1, it says, This is the document containing the family records of Adam. On the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, and he created them male and female. And when they were created, he blessed them and called them mankind. Uh, it's interesting there because... Uh, those, those words there, if they sound familiar to you, they're the same words we see in Genesis chapter 1. And so as the author begins and he's going to tell the story of the line through Seth, he's connecting it to Genesis chapter 1. And he's saying that in a way God is starting over again here, right? God through Adam is now starting over again through Seth. 
And the line of Seth, in contrast to the line of Cain, is marked by those who sought and carried out the purposes of the Lord. And so if you were to, to, to summarize the, the one line of Cain, we would say, no, they're, they're, they're marked by human worldly advancement, moral decay, and, and kind of just focused on themselves. But in contrast, the line of Seth here, right, this is the line that at the end of chapter four says, the, they begin to call on the name of the Lord. And they sought to, to carry out the purposes of the Lord. And we're going to see that as we continue to read. Look in verse 3, chapter 5. It says, Adam was 130 years old when he fathered a son in his likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Adam lived 800 years, and he fathered Seth, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Adam's life lasted 930 years, and then he died. Seth was 105 years old when he fathered Enosh. And Seth lived 807 years after he fathered Enosh, and and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Seth's life lasted 912 years, and then he died. And then Enosh was 90 years old when he fathered Kenan. And as you you read on, once again, as you look at this slide, it continues to tell the story, right? Kenan, then um, father is Mahaliel, and then um, Jared, and then um, eventually we get to Enoch. And did you notice a pattern there? Um, the pattern is they, uh, they mention the name, right? There's the birth, then there's, they give the age at which these men had children, the number of years they lived after their children, and then kind of a summation, and, and then they die. And so even though, right, these, this line is calling on the name of the Lord, they're still living outside the garden, right? Death is a reality that they cannot escape. In fact, that's, that's kind of one of the, if you could say there's a couple of things here on the line of Seth, it's that they had children and then they died. They had children and then they died. Until, right, you, you see this pattern, until you get down to Enoch. And in verse 18, we see this pattern is broken. And notice what it says about Enoch, the seventh descendant from the line of Seth. It said, Jared was 162 years old when he fathered Enoch. And Jared lived 800 years after he fathered Enoch, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Jared's life lasted 962 years, and then he died. Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. And after he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. Enoch walked with God and then he was not there because God took him. So when you get to Enoch, something very unusual happens. I think this is on purpose. Death is not mentioned with Enoch. Enoch here, right, we get a little commentary that he is someone who he walked with with God. And when you think about that phrase, walked with God, it it indicates um, relationship, intimacy, that Enoch's life was, was headed in the same direction as, as God. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. We see the Lord walking in the garden. So before the fall, before they were placed outside of the garden, we see Adam and Eve walking with the Lord. But now, right, because of sin, they were driven out of the garden. And yet here, somehow, Enoch, in, in a different way, We see him walking with God. Now, how how did Enoch do this? What kind of relationship did the Enoch have with God and able to go down in history, right? This is the this is the internet here, and, and if you Googled his name, right, I mean, how do you get to go down as the guy who walked with God? How did Enoch do this? Well, the writer of Hebrews uh, mentions a lot of these characters that we read about in the book of Genesis. And one of the persons that he talks about in Hebrews chapter 11, in the chapter of faith, he mentions Enoch. This Enoch that's mentioned here in Genesis chapter 5. And notice what the writer of Hebrews says about Enoch. He says, by faith, Enoch was taken away. And so he did not experience death 
He was not to be found because God took him away, for he, before, before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. And now without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So what does he say about Enoch? He, he says, he kind of repeats what the writer of Genesis says here, but he says, how does, how does one please God? How does one live a life that's approved by God? And Enoch Enoch does this by living by faith. Enoch was a man who walked with God, and he walked with God by faith. Now, what does this mean? Well, at the very basic level, it says that Enoch walked by faith with God. He simply believed that God existed. Think about that. I mean, Enoch here, we don't have any... Any story here in Genesis where God speaks directly to Enoch or in some way God appears, right? There's no, there's no theophany where we, we see God appearing or some angel coming down to talk with Enoch. As far as we know, the God that Enoch knew was grounded in the stories of his ancestors. Uh, perhaps Adam might have been a little over 700 years old at this point in time. And so Enoch would have heard stories about uh, the garden. Right? He would have heard stories about what taken place with his ancestors. But still, Enoch was not, was not an eyewitness to God. He had to believe by faith. Uh, the world had become such a different place than it was in the garden. It had become evil. In fact, a couple hundred years later, and we'll read this next week in chapter 6, we have the great flood, right? And God just chooses, he looks at the evil in the world and things are so bad. He decides to bring judgment upon the whole world. And this is, the, this is the world that Enoch lived in. And so it's not like he looked around and just saw evidence of God everywhere. No, this is a man, Enoch, who was walking with God by faith. And I would say, listen, this is true for us this morning as well, isn't it? That if we want to walk with God, the first question you have to, to answer is that, do you by faith believe that God exists? Do you by faith believe that God exists? Many of us would probably say this is a, you know, that, that's a question for people outside of the church. But you know that I believe it's entirely possible for, for us to, to come to church, to do the activities, to go to Bible study, to even come in here and worship and miss out on God, not do it by faith. Uh, we know that throughout Scripture, even Cain knew, believed, and knew there was a God, but he didn't come to God by faith. Right? Many of us, many of us believe there is a God, but the question that we need to ask is that do we have faith in God? Are we walking with God? By faith, it's, it's, it's by faith, right, that we open our Bibles and, and believe that these are the very words of God. And listen, if you have trouble kind of being consistent in your devotional life or just kind of opening the Bible and it feels real dry to you, I want to ask you this morning, do you approach even opening your Bible by faith? Do you by faith truly believe that, that these are the words of God written to you? And that by faith, when you sit down and open the word, that you are, you are conversing with God, right? You by faith believe that he actually lives in you through the power of his spirit. And his spirit desires to, you by faith believe that his spirit desires to illuminate his word to you so that you can know him. Do you by faith, even this morning, did you by faith come and gather in this place? As we begin to sing these words, right? We've sung incredible words this morning about the gospel and what God has done for us through his, through his son, Jesus Christ. And, and my question for you this morning, listen, is as you were singing those things by faith, did you really believe they were true? I mean, did you, do you really believe that by faith that God sent his son to die for you, that you were so sinful that you couldn't, you couldn't save yourself? And yet a holy God 
loved you and, and gave his son for you? Do you, by faith, do you, do you believe and, and sing these things? Or are they just kind of words, just things out there that, you know, truths that you might agree with? But are, do, are you singing by faith, understanding that they, they've eternally changed your life? Do you, by faith this morning, right, know that you're loved and forgiven by God? If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, that is a reality that's true about you. You are deeply loved by God. You are forgiven of all your sins by God. You are holy and blameless in His sight. And and my friends, if you truly believe that by faith, it changes everything. That may not be how you feel right now about yourself. You may feel very sinful. You may feel like God doesn't love you, and we've all been there. My friends, those who walk with God, we, we, we walk by faith. And what we know is true, not by how we feel. By faith, we live in a way that honors the Lord. We obey Him, even when it's difficult, right? We sacrifice, we, we give ourselves to him and his purposes and live for his glory by faith. These things don't make sense in this world, but by faith, in the same way, it probably didn't make sense for Enoch to walk with the God by faith in the world that he lived in. No, we all have, listen, every one of us has a faith in something, don't we? Even if you're not a religious person, you just happen to be here this morning. Every person who is alive has faith in something or someone. The question is, what do you have faith in? And Enoch is a man who by faith, he chose to live his life in in the opposite direction of, of, of the evil world that he was living in. He chose to walk with God. And we see a couple of specific ways that, that he did this. And I, as I look at the book of Hebrews and look at what's said about Enoch in the book of Genesis, there, there are two specific ways that I think that, that Enoch walked with God by faith. And the first is this, is by faith Enoch held on to the God's promise. Enoch held on to God's promise. Uh, Enoch not only believed there uh, in, in a God, but he believed in the God of the promise. And it's that promise that I mentioned there in the garden. I, I believe that as um, God put the judgment down on the serpent and said that, you know, there will be hostility between you and the woman, right, for generations to come and, and you will bruise her seed's heel, but, right, the seed of the woman will eventually crush your head, serpent. That was a, a promise of hope to the very first humans, right, Adam and Eve, and they held on to this because as they left the garden, life was not like it once was. Life was tough, right? Work was frustrated, everything. Uh, human relationships were frustrated. There was, there was this distance between God and man. And so life was not what it once was, but there was a longing for, for it to be, right? For everything to be restored. And so they held on to this promise that one day a seed would come from the woman and, and eventually, right, crush the head of the serpent and, and everything would be new. Everything would be different. And so Enoch holds on to this promise that he received from his parents that, and, and he continued to hold on to it. And notice what you see down at the end of chapter um, 5, verse 28 and 29. I think this is more evidence that, that the line of Seth here was holding on to something, believing that God eventually was going to send someone to, to, to save his people. In verse 28, it says, Lamech was 182 years old when he fathered a son, and he named him Noah, right? And this is the Noah with Noah in the flood, right? Noah in the ark. And, and it's saying, this one Noah will bring us relief from the agonizing labor of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. And so what is Lamech here? Once again, this is a different Lamech than the other Lamech. Okay, this Lamech is the one through the line of Seth. And what is, it, what is he saying Noah is going to be? Noah's going to want, maybe Noah is going to be the one that eventually brings us relief, right? That, that, that is this promised seed that's going to come. And we know that Noah in some way, God used Noah, as we'll see next week. And many of you already know in a, in a pretty profound way. But ultimately, he is not the, the Messiah, right? He's not the one that's ultimately promised that's going to crush the head of the serpent. But in the same way, you see, right? 
this promise being perpetuated, being believed by generation after generation. And, and Enoch here is believing in this, right? He's believing this promise that there will be one who is to come that will rescue, right? That will bring relief to his people. And here's what I want to tell you this morning. Enoch's problem in life, right, that the world's been frustrated is our problem. And Enoch's solution here, right, this promise is our promise, Enoch's salvation is our salvation. And as Enoch looked forward to the day that one day would be fulfilled by the person of Jesus Christ, now we look back. We look back and we place our faith in what Jesus has done. And what we see here is that the only way that that you and I can be rescued and and find relief from from this world, from our sin, and experience salvation is through Jesus Christ. Cain was all about saving himself, right? Lamech, down from Cain's line, he's not holding on to a promise. No, he, he takes life. His confidence is in the work of his hands, human advancement. It's a, it's a picture of what's to come eventually in the heart of man that even the flood can't cure because eventually we'll see them building a, a tower trying to reach heaven. This is the spirit of Cain. And yet, in contrast, we see Enoch holding on to the hope that one day God is going to do something through man. And we know that comes to fruition in the person of Jesus Christ. And so, the hope of Enoch is your hope this morning. Listen, if you're looking for relief and rescue from this beaten and weary and evil world, if you're looking for relief and rescue from the evil that lives inside of you and the sin that you battle, it can only come through Jesus Christ. He is our hope. So by faith, Enoch held on to God's promise. And then secondly, I would say this, by faith, Enoch saw God as his greatest reward. Enoch saw God as his greatest reward in the midst of all the ungodliness that was going on during Enoch's day, all kinds of perversion. By faith, Enoch lived for the reward of God. That's what the the writer of Hebrews says about Enoch. Enoch, in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, he says, Now without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Enoch believed there was, right, he had faith that there was great value, great worth in knowing and, and walking with God. I want to ask you, do you believe that this morning? Right? Do you believe that, that walking with God is the most valuable thing that you could do with your life? Because listen, we give ourselves to what we believe will give us the greatest reward. Ultimately in this life, you will give yourself to what you, what you think will bring you the greatest reward. And so if you think money and um, position and power will bring you your greatest reward in life, you know what you'll do? You'll spend the rest of your life pursuing those things. If you think pleasure with the opposite sex is is what's going to ultimately bring you the greatest reward in life, then you will spend your life leveraging your life, seeking to exploit others in that way. If you think your greatest reward in life is through family, and, and listen, there's nothing wrong with a lot of these things. There's nothing wrong with any of these things in certain measures, but if you think family is your greatest reward in life, then you will spend your life investing in in your family, focusing on your family, and your family will become an idol. And my friends, it will not be enough. Enoch saw the greatest thing that he could invest in in this life. The greatest reward would come from walking with God. And he walked with God, and this amazing thing happened after he walked with God for over 300 years. It says that he was eventually taken by God. Now, isn't that just crazy odd? He was taken by God. There's only two people in Scripture that we know of that that didn't experience death, like we would, will experience death more than likely. And it, uh, one was Elijah in Second Kings uh, chapter 2. There's this flaming chariot that comes down. Remember the story about Elijah, the prophet Elijah, this flaming chariot comes down with these horses on fire. Strange story, I know. But ultimately they come down and they take Elijah up into heaven. 
But that same, those same words taken up into heaven, we see them here in the life of Enoch. Elijah wasn't the first. No, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not experience death. And so here we have Enoch, his greatest companion on earth was God. His greatest, his greatest reward on earth was to walk with God. And what he did by faith here on earth, he would now do face to face in heaven. What Enoch would do once, once by faith on earth, we know that he would eventually do face to face in heaven. Enoch went to be with his most intimate friend. I want to I want to plead with you this morning to know, listen, there's nothing more valuable you could do with your life. And and there's nothing wrong with using your God-given gifts in this world for advancement, to be all you can be at work and in your home. Make a living for yourself. Make a good life for yourself. But listen, there is nothing more valuable that can be associated with your name, this side of heaven and the next, than, than, than you walked with God. That by faith that you could walk with God. How does Enoch not experience death like everybody else experiences death? He walks with God. There's no greater reward than to take, uh, than to by faith take hold of the promise of God in Jesus Christ and to daily walk with God. For those who walk by faith with God on earth, we too escape the power of death, don't we? We might physically die, but ultimately for those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, we know that death has no ultimate power over us. No, we too can live eternity with God and walk with him there. Let's pray together. This morning as we respond to the text, would you just, I would ask you to consider, you know, what, what would your life be known for this morning? If someone were to write a couple of sentences about your life, what would they say you value? What would they say is your greatest reward that you're striving after? Or if you're here this morning and you've, you kind of wonder what it even looks like to walk with God, you do, that's, this is all new to you. I would say the, the first step is to place your faith in Jesus Christ. That the only way that we can walk with God initially is to place our faith in Jesus and what he's done on the cross. And this morning, if you've never, if you've never taken that step, that's where you need to begin.